Thanks, Joe, for that introduction, and it is a delight to be in this, uh, this very special church, um, church that's uh, a sacred place in American history and, and religious history, and of course, uh, a place associated with Mark Twain. And I have been at Quarry Farm here, and it's been such a delightful, just delightful place, both uh, in terms of the, the scenery and the, the weather, um, but also the, the scholarship and the kindness um, that's been extended to me through the, the Mark uh, Twain's um, studies center here. Um, so tonight's lecture, uh, I'm gonna discuss Samuel Clemens and Mark Twain's preoccupations with money and the role that this plays in his creative life, his inventive use of language, his critiques of culture and politics and race, and the deeper imaginative patterns that shaped his work. Um, this, book will try, this talk will try and cover you know, the arc of Twain's writings, um, but I'm gonna come at it kind of backwards uh, in the sense that the story for me that is the key, the distillation of so much of his financial thinking is one that's kind of not obscure but not particularly thought about very much, um, the million pound banknote, a story he, he published in, in, in 1893. Um, and I'm gonna use that story as a way to kind of range over his, his thinking about money and, and the way that, you know, hopefully this is something we can, all of us have experience with money. <laughs> um, all of us have experience with thinking about money. But the way that his thinking about money um, revolutionized literary forms, uh, the, the changes in the 19th century in relation to money were, were transforming the culture in many ways. And, and he's very sensitive to this. And, and I think um, it's, it's, of course, there are many sources one could look at but it's, uh, it's sort of central to his imagination. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about the story uh, for a little bit here. Um, Mark Twain's short story of the million pound banknote is a first person parable of paper money. The narrative relates the adventure of Henry Adams, a 27 year old mining broker's clerk in San Francisco, who on one Saturday afternoon ventured too far while sailing a small craft on the bay and was carried out to sea. He is picked up by a London-bound brig and deposited in the British metropolis, ragged, impoverished, and starving. In London, contemplating how to unobtrusively obtain and devour a barely eaten pear resting in the gutter in fashionable Portland Place, he is summoned by two wealthy, eccentric gentlemen into their elegant townhouse. These brothers had been arguing over the fate of a hypothetical stranger who, while honest and intelligent, is turned adrift in London without a friend and with no money but a million pound banknote and no way to account for his being in possession of it. One brother maintains that the stranger will starve to death within a term of 30 days. The other brother that he would not and would manage to stay out of jail. The brothers, with the stalwart forthrightness that Twain's satiric sensibility regularly attributes to Englishmen, make a, a wager of 20,000 pounds. Straight away, they purchase the 1, 000, 1 million pound note from the Bank of England, and spying Adams in the street, select him for their experiment. Without giving him many details of his actual predicament in order to control his participation, one brother hands Adams an envelope containing the, a bank, the banknote and a letter that reads. Um, and here you can see that slide, uh, what I'm gonna read to you there. Um, you are an intelligent and honest man, as one may see by your face. We conceive you to be poor and a stranger. Enclosed, you will find a sum of money. It is lent to you for 30 days without interest. Report at this house at the end of that time. I have a bet on you. If I win it, you shall have any situation that is in my gift, any that is that you shall be able to prove yourself familiar with and competent to fill. So that's the premise. It's kind of an elaborate premise for a story here. Overpowered by hunger and seeing it, they have given him some money, but without bothering to read the letter or take a look at the precise denomination of the bill, Adams rushes off to dine at a cheap eating house. And then when approached for payment, offers the note which he had tucked in his vest pocket to the proprietor and casually asks uh, for change. The proprietor's suspicions of his ragged customer melts into reverential awe at the talismanic power of the proffered banknote. 
and construing Adams to be an eccentric millionaire, the stunned eating house owner refuses to accept payment for such a trifle and is merely flattered by such lofty patronage. Adams attempts to return the note to the brothers, but finding that they have left for the continent, proceeds to pull the same maneuver all over town, trading in his ragged outfit for a fine suit and soon enough well-appointed fashionable lodgings. He soon becomes one of the notorieties of the metropolis of the world. The newspapers refer to him as the vest pocket million pounder. His celebrity is secured when he is caricatured in punch. He even keeps his old suit of rags and every now and then appeared in them so as to have the old pleasure of buying trifles and being insulted and then shooting the scoffer dead with the million pound bill. Invitations to fashionable dinner parties follow. At one of these events, he makes the acquaintance of a society belle and proceeds to court her. He also bumps into an old friend and business associate from San Francisco who is in London attempting without success to drum up investors for a mining expedition in Nevada, the Gould and Curry extension, that's part of the Comstock load. Um, using Adam's newfound name and fame, his friend sells out in two weeks and the two divide the profits of the sale from which Adams realizes a million dollars or 200,000 pounds. Um, at the end of 30 days, he returns the bill to the brothers, learns that his London bell, named Portia, no less, um, is the stepdaughter of one of them. Adams promptly marries her, and they receive the canceled banknote as a wedding present and a symbol of the situation that was in his stepfather's gift. Unlike the man that corrupted Hadleyburg, a tale that appears to be its obverse in which a $40,000 sack of gold destroys the reputation of a small prideful town, Twain's airy banknote story seems in general to lack the moral gravitas to attract sustained critical attention or regular anthologizing. It was first published in the Century magazine in January 1893 and soon collected in uh, the Million Pound Banknote and other stories. And it was considered ingenious and highly farcical and amusing, uh, but basically light. Um, when readers have interpreted it, they tend to read the story in biographical terms, but they focus on the panicky days of uh, its production. It was completed in Florence at uh, Via Viviani outside uh, that city in the fall of 1892 and published during those financially troubled years um, when the depressed economy and Clemens' uh, imprudent investments in the Page Compositor and the decline of his publishing house um, forced him into bankruptcy. Um, In this context, the story appears to be a wistful projection, in the words of Lewis J. Budd, or a credit fantasy, in which a fictional surrogate for the author is restored to affluence through a whimsical 30-day interest-free loan of a million pounds. Now, the truth of Budd's suggestion seems palpable to anyone familiar with Twain's biography. Um, and the story um, has kind of a typical sort of uh, function in terms of Twain's humor, the conversion of pain into pleasure um, that you see over and over in, in his work. Um, but to read the story, I think, as a private allegory of a particular moment in his career, or even in general theory of humor, is only a partial reckoning. Um, for one, Twain's notebooks record entries as early as 1879 that mention the premise for the story. Um, for another, while it's not clear when the story is set, there's nothing to indicate it that should be read as taking place in the present moment. Uh, indeed, many of the references in it point to earlier sort of moments in Twain's career. Um, uh, the details um, supplied for Adam's background as a mining broker from San Francisco um, uh, sort of lead us to roughing it um, and the early parts of his writing career. Um, when Twain first made his tour of England in 1872 and 73, he stayed at the ultra-fashionable Langham in Portland Place. Um, uh, and so the name of the brothers who make the bet are the Langham brothers uh, in, in this story. Um, and, um, and that hotel was the base of operations uh, from which he launched himself as a public figure in England. Um, Similarly, uh, the name of his love interest, Portia Langham, uh, resembles that of Olivia uh, Langdon, uh, Livy, his wife. Um, 
and uh, the, uh, his friend, who he, um, the business associate with whom he uh, just sells the, the, the mining shares, is called Lloyd Hastings. Um, and there's a, a stockholder in his publishing company called E.G. Hastings. Um, so it seems like he's calling uh, sort of figures from his publicity career, his speaking career um, from the 1870s. Um, and, and in other words, more than uh, allegorizing a private destiny, more than the routine emotional jujitsu of humor, the banknote converts more than mere biographical pain into fictive pleasure. However, while it's always been evident that the million town banknote must be part of that concern with money, it's not easy to figure out exactly where in his career uh, you might put this dreamy fantasy. Um, reading the story in terms of his financial crisis sort of limits its scope um, because as Justin Kaplan wrote, Twain was so obsessed in his life and work with the lure, the rustle, the chink and heft of money not only do we find it front and center in the story that concerns this essay, we find it to be a central concern of so many of his writings. So The Gilded Age, his first novel that he co-wrote with Charles Dudley Warner, has, um, of course, a, a fundamental plot dealing with um, investments and speculation in land um, and graft in Congress. Um, you have uh, The American Claimant, uh, a text where Twain has another figure um, uh, who basically uh, is attempting to make a claim and take a whole lineage and a whole sort of um, set of generations of wealth in one fell swoop. Of course, there's the prince and the pauper, uh, the $30,000 bequest, and other stories, the man that corrupted Hadleyburg and the mysterious stranger. Um, ju just to name a few, of course, you can also think about moments in other texts that don't centrally turn on questions of money, uh, whether it's the treasure um, in uh, the end of uh, Tom Sawyer uh, that sets, of course, Huckleberry Finn into motion, and of course, questions of slavery um, also turn on money. Um, the theme of money frequently with a sense of the absurd runs like a crimson thread through many of the works from the silver fever of roughing it to Jim's recitation in Huckleberry Finn of his bumpy investment history with its powerfully ironic turn towards his economic valuation of his own person. They reappear in the money subplots of Puddinghead Wilson involving Driscoll and Chambers and recurring discussions of savings and remittances uh, the speckle following the equator. Money talk is a notable feature of Twain's first great success, The Innocence Abroad, um, with its extensive passages on such topics as exotic coins, money changers, and the exchange rates that leave the traveler weighed down with quarts of small change. In Tangier, Twain even mentions that in a partial harbinger of one of the conceits behind Henry Adams' London masquerade, there are many rich men in the empire, but their money is buried and they dress in rags and counterfeit poverty. Um, just exactly the performance that you see of um, Henry Adams in the million pound banknote. Indeed, Huck Finn is another character in possession of a fortune who prefers to go about in his old rags. Um, Twain's stories in this vein have been likened to those by O. Henry and Horatio Alger, the ragged dick stories of rags to riches, but in Twain's fictive world, the rags of poverty are not exactly jettisoned by those who are transformed by sudden wealth. Twain never felt that his many varied utterances of financial matters amounted to an overarching or coherent fiscal picture, but there are clearly patterns, themes, and concerns he returned to again and again. As uh, Henry Wonham has suggested in his persuasive reading of the monetary and economic elements of a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, the big novel that he wrote right before the million pound banknote. Um, Hank Morgan and Mark Twain do have views about finance, views that are sometimes eccentric, sometimes silly, but that speak more directly than we have appreciated to the changing economic landscape of the United States in the last years of the 19th century. Much the same could be said of the million pound banknote. And the problem of Mark Twain and money can be generalized in that it has to do with the tension between the playful wit and language and ingenuity in Twain's monetary fictions and a critical drive to extract, 
abstract from his humor, satire, wish fulfillment, boys' adventure treasure schemes, and a wide range of verbal byplay, a coherent set of ideological planks that might resemble a white paper on monetary policy. Um, no, um, I think um, that um, in light of what we know about Twain's monetary and social considerations, the goal of extracting a particular economic policy is not so much uh, the idea, but to see how money is part and parcel of his imagination, how it resonates with his creative life. And whether one looks at Samuel Langhorne Clemens or the literary output of Mark Twain, the language of money and monetary valuation permeates the American idiom he so masterfully deployed in many instances and invented. When his powers of witty conversation had temporarily deserted him, he declared that he couldn't scintillate worth a cent. Um, I love that particular one. Um, uh, you know, to me, it's like there he is in the 1870s already having to be the funny man constantly. Um, the idea, here, say something funny. Do it again. Oh, did you say that one? Repeat it for the press. Um, that constant weight of the pressure of um, needing to perform, um, both in his private and public life. Um, his correspondence is rife with colorful monetary figures, frequently concerning gradation, gradations of mendacity or ineffectual creativity. To tip a nickel from a weeping convert's pocket while he prayed over him, he once described a corrupt New York shipping commissioner to the editor of the New York World, would be more in his line, one would suppose. Um, Bristling with irony, he once wrote to his mother, comparing his own wattage of intellect to the feeble candle power of some rivals, that he was too generous to allow the glare from my lamp of genius to dim the feeble luster of their two penny dips. Um, the language of money, the play of language as it circulates in his monetary imagination was deeply entwined with Twain's native wit, his sense of human nature, and his own creative powers. And as such, it supplies the underlying motif of the million town banknote. Paper money, that supreme marker of credit and capital, capital, the explosive instrument of the rampantly speculative gilded age, functions as the story's central conceit and drives its engine of identity transformation. Paper money so portable, so impersonal, so promiscuous, legal tender, as the American bills conspicuously read, for all debts, public and private, suggests that we must account for the story of spectral wealth in terms of cultural mechanisms at once more fundamentally commercial, collective, and literary. The million pound banknote is about how capital can be converted into cultural capital, and how cultural capital, in turn, can be transformed back into capital then into cash, then into status, and then into matrimony. So what I'm trying to do in this little talk is to clarify Twain's thoughts about money in terms uh, of, um, not in terms of economic policy, but to demonstrate how Twain came to use his imaginative powers in monetary terms, the coinage of his brain circulating like currency. Um, uh, and this, is, this story reflects the mentality of Twain's generation. As Philip Fisher has suggested, it rotated in the Gilded Age, dizzily around a pole of wealth. Twain's was a world of prospectors, claim holders, and future values. Um, in this sense, Twain's monetary imagination flowed with the main currents of his time. The pleasures of his fictions were linked to the pleasures of capital, the dreams of success and sudden wealth. Um, in this context, Twain's uncashable banknote functions as another instrument through which the powers of cultural speculation might be measured, manipulated, and transformed into more secure forms. But as I suggested, Twain's monetary imagination was also attracted to the absurd. And this signals an extent to which Twain's thinking diverged from or pushed against the limitations of the mentality of the Gilded Age. The absurdity of Adam's predicament with the banknote takes up a very modern issue of fungibility. In the case the banknote denominated a million pounds cash, the prime example of a fungible asset becomes, of a, because of its size, it becomes a de facto NFT, 
uh, a non-fungible token, which we all become very familiar with in these last few years. Um, it becomes a unique artifact associated exclusively with Adams and his public identity. And it also enjoys another oddity not generally seen within non-fungible tokens. It expires like a futures option or some other form of a derivative um, in a 30-day period. Um, to a certain extent, the story is a bet about the futures market in which Adams is compelled to bet on his own future, a 30-day derivative for which there is no market until he leverages his fame to sell mining stock options. In the slyest of gestures, Twain hints that Adams has been operating in this mindset all along when he mentions at the very outset of the story that he had set his feet in the road to eventual fortune and was content with the prospect. But the private sense of identity, the conventional and vague sense of um, a future or a career only becomes manifest as a monetizable entity when his fortunes and identity are tethered to this outrageous currency and pressurized by a firm time limit to begin to circulate in public. It may also be said that the story derives from a moment when his imagination is fixating on commercial formula as the generative mechanisms of, for his fiction. Um, the light satire of the London society um, in the story of the banknote suggests the kinds of plays that George Bernard Shaw was beginning to achieve success with in the 1890s and first decade of the 20th century. Um, uh, and here, let me just show you uh, a few examples. So, so if, if you know Major Barbara from 19... Now, of course, Twain knew Shaw and Shaw, and they'd met on several occasions. Um, and, and, and I think that it's been undervalued the degree to which Twain has clearly influenced um, sociological premise-driven comedies. Um, so the idea of Major Barbara, which has Andrew Undershaft and his family um, having a custom that only orphans can take over under Shaft Enterprises um, is, is, is right out of Twain, um, this kind of sense of that. Uh, of course, Pygmalion is probably the most uh, celebrated one where Henry Higgins makes this famous wager to transform Eliza Doolittle into Passeroff as a duchess. Um, simply by transforming her methods of, of speaking and holding, carrying herself. Um, uh, Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life um, is perhaps a, a, another important financial fiction where G George Bailey is a version of Henry Adams in the story. And you might remember that, that Clarence, uh, the angel who saves George Bailey in, in this Frank Capra classic, ha as a great lover of, of Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer, and he leaves him a copy of Tom Sawyer under the Christmas tree after he saved his life there, giving you a kind of sense that, that, that Capra is deeply aware of the genealogy of the kind of narrative that he's talking about. Um, John Landis's Trading Places, 1981, uh, a classic, you know, really wonderful movie, uh, if you haven't seen it, um, where Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd um, trade places um, based on a bet between the arrogant brothers here who try to corner the uh, orange juice commodities market. Um, and there, it's again, uh, the same kind of social experiment that, that is, is driving um, the million pound banknote here. Um, so th th that's just to give you a, a kind of sense of that. Um, and we might think of um, the idea that, um, uh, but, but, but also we have, we have these, this sense of um, Twain sort of working through his own formula. Um, so you have uh, a Connecticut Yankee is transported to Arthurian England. An English lord is placed in America. That's the American claimant. A master and slave are switched at birth. Puddinhead Wilson. Um, Tom Sawyer is transplanted to the continent. Tom Sawyer abroad. Tom Sawyer is made a detective. Tom Sawyer detective. Um, the premise-oriented, sometimes gag-oriented ideas, th those extraordinary twins um, where you have Siamese twins sort of connected and then he forgets that he's connected them or separated them. Um, uh, you have this recombinant originality, which I think of as Twain, um, we might call a commercial novelty or remixing that distinguishes productions. Um, these are mashups. Um, Twain is, 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 his creative imagination is, 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 um, is hybrid. 
um, and it signals sort of a maturation of his literary life, the elements of prior literary creation circulating in new circumstances. Sometimes it's characterological. You don't know about me without you have read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, uh, is how Huckleberry Finn begins, right? Uh, sometimes it's metatextual, sort of the ways that entries from Puddinghead Wilson's um, new calendar um, function in following the equator. Um, or um, the past that Twain had made triumphantly usable and fictional has matured into an imaginative economy where his prior creations and gambits might recirculate. Rather than presenting the reader with adventures, he pre represents them with ventures. Um, and it pres presages uh, that kind of mashup culture where all new projects can be seen as derivative hybridizations. Um, indeed, we might say that it's this quality that attracted him to the page compositor. Uh, you know, people have talked about why didn't he know uh, that this was not going to work. But the beautiful dream of the page compositor was, as one fellow printer, uh, Theodore Devin, said, um, that uh, this is thought crystallized. It unravels any old fabric and from it reweaves any new design which the imagination of man can conceive. Um, it's almost like, you know, when the, when the, the Mac was invented, um, this incredible device holds out the promise of infinite imaginative recombination. Um, and, and to me, thus in the 1890s, Twain was increasingly in the habit of recirculating jokes, characters, plot elements, and new narrative economies, um, giving the familiar lineaments of his imagination a new currency. As a consequence, these stories all seem to have deus ex machina beginnings. Um, and um, in all of these ways, the quanta of Twain's imagination, the scenarios, characters, plot, elements, and local complications function with increasing artificiality of their premises like literary currency. Just as the public humorist and wit needed to scintillate worth the scent as he rose to fame in the 1870s, the mature author continued to prospect for literary ore. For Twain, I suggest these elements function like symbolic commodities. Um, symbolic commodities with the properties of paper and metallic currency. The materiality of writing, printing, and publishing was for Twain intrinsically paper-oriented. And yet the ideas themselves, the seemingly intangible elements, ironically circulated like gold pieces or other species of bullion, self-authorized, copyrighted paper that also functioned much as he viewed metallic currency. Um, like coins and as coins, two may possess both symbolic and commodity value. The elements of Twain's imagination are portable, transferable, resaleable, friable, and bearers of exchange value in the marketplace of ideas. Um, in The Million Pound Banknote, it is perhaps best to think of Henry Adams linked to the banknote as a commercial unit in and of itself, a hybrid symbol commodity circulating for the public's edification and amusement. And in the tale's end, we are told, when London got the whole history of my month's adventures with the banknote, did London talk and have a good time? Yes. <laughs> That's how the story sort of resolves itself. Um, um, now, it's of course a matter of speculation whether the financial of, of pressures of the 1890s exacerbated this tendency in Twain's pro imaginative process. It's perhaps wisest to view the monetary elements of Twain's imagination as abiding. Clemens had a very direct experience with the fluctuations of unsecured US paper currency in the Nevada territory days as recorded in Roughing It. Um, there he describes the deflationary problems of greenbacks, which were legal tender notes uh, unsecured by gold, made necessary by the tremendous cost of the Civil War. Um, territorial merchants, in fact, if you remember just a few months ago when we were heading towards a fiscal sort of crisis, if they were not going to uh, raise the debt ceiling, um, people were talking about um, going back to a greenback sort of pos policy and maybe using a hybrid gold standard and paper sort of idea to, to have different levels of tiers of securitizing things. But he, he, he was um, uh, very, very aware of this, um, that um, uh, territorial merchants refused to accept payment in greenbacks unless it was at their, 
at their gold, not their nominal value. Now, as Clemens' brother uh, Orion explained to a correspondent in his capacity as territorial governor, legal tender notes are here merchandise. We have no banknotes in circulation, and gold and silver coin is the currency, while in the states, the reverse is the case. Any man in this territory having a legal tender note must sell it for its market price in coin. Um, one of the latent meanings, I would suggest, of lighting out for the territory, what, Tuck, what Huck does at the end of Huckleberry Finn, had to do with entering a perilous world in which government-authorized paper can only be secured and converted into usable assets through market exchange. If this view informs Twain's early monetary experience, it just as plainly resurfaces in a wry public letter dated in 1902 to the US Secretary of the Treasury, complaining about the high cost of winter fuel, placing it out of the reach of literary persons in straitened circumstances, <laughs> and requesting, among other forms of relief, um, 45 tons of best old dry government bonds suitable for furnace, gold 7%, 1864 preferred. 12 tons of early greenbacks, range size, suitable for cooking. Um, so this, this idea of an awareness of the idea that, that paper can always be used for other purposes um, is running sort of um, through it. That, that monetary thought recurs throughout his life. Um, but it gathers a sort of purity and force in the, uh, the story of this American broker and the English banknote um, becomes a sly meditation on paper money as literature and literature as paper money. Um, it may have a temporary value equivalent to the wealth of nations, but without the power to circulate as species, its value is wholly circumscribed with a clear expiration date. In some respects, the million pound banknote functions like the artwork that garnishes the last uh, page of the story when it appeared in the Century magazine. Um, in the bottom margin below the author's name, the magazine had adorned the story with several woodcut linoleum block doodles of Roman coins. The coins are too crudely drawn to be taken for anything but a humorous gesture in keeping with the light touch of the story. As a visual pun, they link Twain's fable of British imperial currency with the imperial currency of Rome, apparently juxtaposing the seemingly humble capital instruments of the ancient world with the modern paper empire issued by the Bank of England. Um, perhaps more subtly, as paper versions of coins of the realm, they are emblematic of the dual nature of Twain's monetized literary imaginary. They symbolize very uncertainties that paper millions seem to stir as um, homely objects invested with imperial wealth and power that can be rapidly valued and just as rapidly devalued. And um, now here, what I'd like to do is just show you um, in uh, a Connecticut Yankee in King of Arthur's court where there are very suggestive overlays of this idea. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this text in, in its details, but um, uh, Hank Morgan, uh, the, the mechanic who's knocked on the head and ends up back in Arthurian England, not only brings munitions and mechanization to Arthurian England, he wants to bring a new economic mentality to it. Um, so uh, his, his Miller gun um, is a kind of commodity currency. Um, Morgan explains that the gun was a purse and a very handy too. You could pay out money in the dark with it with accuracy and you could carry it in your mouth or in your vest pocket if you had one. Um, um, he wants to have the, 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 the currency work that way. Um, and there's even a scene in there where he says this, which is exactly the premise of the million pound banknote. He says, yes, they changed my 20, but I judged it strained the bank a little, which was a thing to be expected. For it was the same as walking into a paltry village store with, in the 19th century and requiring the boss um, of it to change a $2,000 bill for you all of a sudden. He could do it, maybe, but at the same time, he would wonder how a small farmer happened to be carrying so much money around in his pocket, which was probably this goldsmith's thought too, for he followed me to the door and stood there gazing after me with reverent admiration. Um, so he's interested again in this idea of like, what happens when you lay a big wad of cash onto someone in a large bill? 
Um, does anyone still love the pleasure of large bills as my uncle used to give me a $50 bill when I was seven just to burn a hole in my pocket, as they used to say? Um, this idea of the power of uh, the compressed power of wealth in a small form. Um, but here's the place where I think Hank Morgan is actually speaking the proposition that, that I'm making here today. He says, our new money was not only handsomely circulating, but its language was already glibly in use. That is to say, people had dropped the names of the former monies and spoke of things as being worth so many dollars or cents or mills or mill rays now. That is, by changing the currency, by changing the way people thought about value, you started to control the society in a new way, to Americanize them. And of course, Henry Adams is an American coming over sort of into London society and kind of taking over in a way, just as Hank Morgan does. Um, and I think Twain saw the implications of how the future would be that, that the world would run on the American dollar. And that future is going to be determined by the way we think about money. Um, let me, uh, in the interest of time here, I'm going uh, um, to, I'm going to skip a couple slides here, uh, and I'm going to go to tell you about a little bit of the history of its publication here. So, in um, 1892, when Twain completed his story, um, he is in, um, he's in Italy, and he writes to. Uh, Richard Watson Gilder, the editor of the Century Magazine. And here's, here's the, the, the letter um, here. Um, and he has literary money matters on his mind. He says, well, you see what little I've written lately was kind of forced into the syndicates, he began, because they seduce a person by the large wage they pay, which is double and treble what the magazines grant to the laborer in the literary field. McClure's syndicate had been aggressively courting writers like Twain to expand newspaper readership, drawing his literary output away from the more genteel audiences of the monthly magazines, of which the century was the most prominent at the time. Despite Twain's mildly proletarian language, wage and laborer there, we hear the entrepreneur at work, calculating the circulation of his own literary destiny. Naturally, I prefer to be in the magazines, but you see how it is. Big enough money trumps prestige as a literary lever. I've only one mag article on hand at present, but I'll enclose that to you, the million pound banknote. If you like it, and I don't see why you shouldn't, it's a noble and elegant tale. Um, you can send to me at the above address the amount you elect to pay. And thus the million pound banknote, both the paper currency itself and the story that it relates its circulation, for all its nobility and elegance, begins its literary career where the story ends with its author trying to determine the market value of its paper currency. Okay, so I wanna just give you in, in a little, a few, last few minutes here, just um, a few ideas of where, where, where you can go with this sort of thought. Um, and one of them is, uh, I want to talk about uh, famous, probably one of his most famous quotes. Um, uh, in his autobiography, uh, Twain recounts uh, that most oft repeated of anecdotes that in the 1890s, when he was living in London, rumors were circulating in the United States that Twain was dying or had died. The New York Evening Sun sent a reporter to Twain's residence for confirmation and finding him alive asked what he should cable in reply. Twain suggested, say the report is greatly exaggerated. Twain adds that his witticism is frequently mentioned when people have occasion to discount exaggerations. Um, but what explicitly prompts Twain's interest in retelling this story, however, does not seemingly have to do with newspapers, misrepresentation, or exaggeration, but rather money and his literary value. Clemens read an article in the New York Times for April 3rd, 1906, reporting the sale at auction of an 1877 letter that he wrote to the political cartoonist Thomas A. Nast that sold for $43. Twain was favorably impressed with the value of his letter. One from U.S. Grant had only fetched something short of $18. <laughs> and it gave him deep happiness to know that in the arena of 
of epistolatory literature, the general and president can't sit in the front seat along with me. Um, what pleases him most is that his literature has more than held its own as regards money value through the stretch of 36 years. Twain calculates that if his work had originally been valued at 10 cents a word by 1906, it was going for 30 cents a word, estimating that I have increased in value nearly two or 300%. The use of the first person is indicative of Twain's jocular conflation of monetary value and selfhood. This forms one of the central axes of his personal humor, the way that the market value of a human being can fluctuate in cartoonish ways, inflating one's value one day, discounting it the next. Once that market value is equated with the self, it becomes subject to a host of absurd fluctuations of ego. Twain liberally took this approach to the presentation of his own person or persona. In this example, Twain, who ushered Grant's biography into print, in no way believes that his contribution to the life of the nation, however great, are genuinely superior to those of the general and president who defeated the Confederacy. And yet, because of an auction of one of his old letters, he's tickled to think of Grant taking a back seat to him. The latent joke within the joke is that as a public persona playing the game of literature, reports of his life have been greatly exaggerated. An old business proposal to Nast about a speaking tour that's all about making money is inflated into epistolatory literature. Um, a few sheets of private communication in no way was conceived by Twain as anything more than a business proposition as claimed as a form of literary expression and then calibrated to his going rate for writing for pay from 10 cents a word in the 1870s to 30 cents a word in 1906. Just as the content of the letter need not possess any literary value to attain market value as literature, it all becomes, in this sense, a matter of exaggeration. Even questions of seemingly fixed status, such as whether or not one is alive or dead, might become a matter of reputation and therefore given to overstatement or exaggeration. The subtleties of famous, Twain's famous jest emerge with an eerie implication about fame, media, and market forces. The ability to make the joke becomes an expression of one's market value as a commodity, a news item, a bit of celebrity information. The final twist of this anecdote makes that equation between life and death, market value, and words explicit. If alive, the reporter was instructed, send 500 words. If dead, send a thousand. Um, okay, I, I don't want to go on too long, but I have one local story here. Another part of my project deals with bets and wagers and speculation. If you know, um, the very first story that made Twain a national uh, celebrity was the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County, and, and that story has Jim Smiley, who will famously bet on anything, take either side of a bet, bet on sickness or health. And so bets run through his career. Um, uh, and so this, this is um, from 1895. Um, and in the summer of 1895, uh, up at Quarry Farm uh, was a stressful one for the Twains, uh, for Mark Twain and for, for his family. Um, he was anxiously preparing to begin his world lecture tour to raise money, to pay back his creditors. He was vacillating on the program, had not got a, quite, himself quite into form for the lecture platform and needed time and small venues to perform the material. He was swimming in writing obligations, um, but he could not get to his study because he was laid up in bed with gout and a painful carbuncle that had to be removed from his thigh and would not heal. This type of boil is caused by a staph infection and often inflicts older men in poor health or with comp compromised immune systems. Um, compounding the stress in the late June, Clemens had been served papers to appear in court um, by a creditor uh, of the Webster Company. Um, another subpoena related to other debts required Livy to appear before one of the justices of the Supreme Court of the state of New York. And the date slated for that appearance was in July after they were to have embarked for Australia. Um, Twain was also in protracted negotiations with Harper Brothers for publishing a uniform edition of his works that involved niggling details as to when he would be allowed to read portions from his new book on Joan of Arc with another, uh, with the Century Magazine, also requesting 12 articles related to his upcoming tour that he did not want to write. Contracts seemed to be deviling him. 
Uh, well, I am a pretty versatile fool, Clemens wrote to H.H. H. Rogers, the Standard Oil executive and friend who was helping with his financial situation. When it comes to contracts and business and such things, I signed a lot of contracts in my time, and at signing time, I probably knew what the contracts meant. But six months later, everything had grown dim, and I could be certain of only two things. To wit, one, I didn't sign any contract. Two, the contract means the opposite of what it says. <laughs> but there was one contract during that summer that he was happy to sign. In fact, he wrote its terms, and it was set down not on paper, but stone. Um, this was what would come to be known as the Wager Stones, a contract he made with his and Livy's longtime friend, Julia Jones Beecher, Mrs. T.K. Beecher, the wife of uh, the founder of this church. Um, and the, um, during one of their conversations, the topic of immortality of the soul had come up. Um, Beecher was for it. Clemens, as Muncie's magazine reported, took the side of unbelief. Now, Mr. Clemens, Beecher said, if you meet me in heaven a million years from now, will you confess yourself wrong? Clemens agreed that he would, but Beecher insisted that the wager be written in stone, one that she plucked from the Susquehanna Riverbed in Pennsylvania, so that the proof of the wager would be present for future generations. Clemens wrote the poem that was written onto three stones of sliced rock. And there you have it. And I'll just read it to you because it might be hard to read. Um, it, so it's a contract with Mrs. T.K. Beecher, Elmira, July 2, 1895. If you prove right and I prove wrong a million years from now, in language plain and frank and strong, my error I'll avow to your dear mocking face. If I prove right, by God his grace, full sorry I shall be, for in that solitude no trace there'll be of you and me nor our vanished race. A million years, O oh patient stone, you've waited for this message. Deliver it a million hence. Survivor pays expressage. I love that the happiest contracts Twain made were made from literature itself. Rather than a business arrangement for money that promises future literary output, it takes the form of a humorous poem. In terms of Twain's monetary imagination, I would like to focus on that final verse which is on the reverse side of the contract stone seen in the slide. Um, in this final verse, he apostrophizes the stone itself, the medium of the contract. He imagines the stone as being at the midpoint of its destiny, laying patiently for a million years in the earth, being inscribed in that moment that Twain set his pen to the stone and then delivered a million years into the future. In other words, it is imagined as being in the process of circulating like currency, like a message for the present, but to the future, which is a pretty good definition of literature. As with reports of his death, immortality never exempts itself from money, commerce, and mediums of exchange. Survivors pay expressage, the old term for express shipping charges, often in those days paid by the recipient. Expressage is also an apt pun for expression. The cost of saying something with the utmost urgency, even across the vast spans of time, even across a million years. Thank you.